Welcome to Sovereign Souls, where every week we speak to a guest that can speak on their perspective in the world today. I'm your host, Javi Lopez, and enjoy the show. Yeah, what's up, Javi? What's up, everybody? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Luis Miguel Lecheray, host analyst uh, with CBS Sports. Uh, do videos and write, and we have a podcast coming out called Que Olazo, a daily CBS soccer podcast. And Javi, I'm just so proud of you, man, that you're doing this. It's awesome to see. Uh, I'm just excited, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, as I said before, the, we started recording. Um, this is a very special project for myself and SBU. And um, yeah, so let's get started. So today we're going to talk about how how you've been affected with COVID and also a lot of your perspective about COVID in the soccer world and also about the Black Lives Matter movement and how you think about it and how it's affected the soccer world as well. And also we're going to talk about at the end about something for for yourself, something that you lived like through, like perspective about stuff. So I'm going to start with the first question is, how do you hope 2020 will be remembered in sports history? How do I hope? Yeah. Me? Yeah. How do I hope that I'm remembered? Yeah, I mean, no, like, how do you hope, like, 2020 will be remembered? In oh, sports? how do I hope 2020 will be remembered in yeah. sports history? Well, it's a good question, Javier, and I think it's a difficult one to try and predict because, obviously, as you mentioned at the top, and, you know, we are dealing with so much more than just sports in 2020, right? It's, it's about the health and livelihood of our people, especially minority communities, not just soccer, not just sports, but everybody, you know, in the US, uh, you know, closer to home in New York and, and all, all over the country, it's very difficult to try and get a perspective on how people will look at this year. If you want a simple answer, you can say that it's been hell, right? It's been, yeah, really. It's been really tough. It's been really hard for young people like yourself. It's been really tough for, uh, parents, it's been really tough for grandparents, especially Latinos, right? I'm Peruvian, um, you know, so uh, I think a lot about my family who's in South America, that Latin America has been really affected. So it's going to be tough. But I think that there's a silver lining, Javi. I think that when you look at the end of this year and you look a year from now, five years from now, 10 yeah. years from now, I think we'll look back and say, you know what? We were resilient. We yeah. fought. And we, and we did everything that we could to stay connected, which brings me to this, to what you're doing. It's, it's really commendable and heroic that, you know, South Bronx United, such an amazing organization. And you like, we're just trying to stay connected. And if that is by doing it through Zoom or social media or whatever, that's all that we can do. So I think we're going to look back and say it was hard as hell. Yeah. But we fought like hell to make it happen and be strong. Yeah, I said this like, in the beginning when this whole happened and I talked to a lot of my teachers and stuff and I said this this is gonna play a big part of like the next generation because like wow like what we went through this whole year it's like we like like what 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 worse things could happen to us that we already had we going right. through, you know? like it's gonna be interesting to see how and also I feel like it brought a lot of people together as well so a lot of people are more nicer to each other are appreciating more life so I think we started to unite more as a people. Like, I mean, unless, like, I'm saying this, but then the whole Black Lives Matter movement came on, which is, like, the opposite. But, like, what I'm saying is, like, a lot of people came came with each other in those times where we were just at home trying to help each other. And that was very, very, very cool to see. I think you said the, the operative word, the important word there, Javi, and that was united. I yeah. think that no matter what, we are united. I mean, you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement and the fight against racial injustice, such an important issue for uh, the black community, but not just the black community, brown communities, minorities all over. Just, just we, we want to be respected. We want to feel safe. We want to, we're fighting for justice. And yes, it's terrible what's happening, but we're united against it, right? Yeah. We've created, you know, when you think about everything that's going on, you know, uh, such a vital presidential election coming up, the Black Lives Matter movement and what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many, you know, uh, people in the black community and how we've just stood together, united to fight a cause, that's caused 
a mountain of voter registration. People now want to yeah. vote. People want to have their voices heard. So it's just like how Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement uh, of the 60s, you know, it's the same thing. We're all, we always have to fight for what's right. And even though the path is difficult, the path is hard, like in the end, we have to see light at the end of the tunnel. And I believe that that's what your demographic is doing and what your age group is doing. Young people are like so inspiring to me. Like, yeah. you know, just everything that you're going through, like gun violence, racial injustice, COVID-19, and yet you still persevere. It's amazing. And, and my hat goes to you and everybody else. And we just got to stay united, man, because like at the yeah. end of the day, that's what it's, what it's all about. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, it's just crazy how like the next few years are going to be like, you, you remember like, if you take back and you remember right now, like five years ago, 2015, like you don't remember like a lot, you know, like you like, oh. 2015, I, Javi, I don't remember last week. <laughs> yeah, like, you're like, wow, like nothing really happened in 2015, but like, I imagine like in 2025, like, yo, 2020 was tough. It was tough, yeah. But like, to your point, we just got to keep going. Listen, it's like, if somebody told you like, I mean, this year has brought so much. I mean, think about Kobe Bryant, right? Like that feels like five years ago, but it was just at the beginning of this year. Like yeah. so many terrible things have happened, but we just got to keep going, man. We got to keep going. We got to keep fighting. So how do you think the professional soccer world specifically has to deal with the pandemic in comparison to the rest of the sports? That's another good question. And it's difficult to just, tone it down and generalize it. Cause obviously, as you know, the soccer world means so many things, right? It means South Bronx United, but it also means, you know, the women's game. It also means what's going on in Europe. It also means what's going on in California or New York or the Americas. Like, so it's very difficult. I think that the best way to answer it is, you know, um, I remember interviewing uh, Tommy Thompson, uh, uh, defender for the San Jose earthquakes in MLS a few uh, months ago. And during the pandemic, when, when there still was no MLS tournament, this was way back like March and April, he decided to do uh, YouTube uh, coaching for kids around the community, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that to me is just as an example of like what the soccer community has done. Like look at this video and this interviews that you're doing, like, we're finding ways to like connect. And I think that's what the soccer community has done. Obviously, like before doing media and CBS and all that stuff, I used to play and coach too, right? And you miss it, right? You miss being like on the pitch, connecting with your friends and, and playing and stuff. And even though things are getting a little better, it's still not the same. When you look at the games, like empty stadiums, it's very, it's tough, but I think that we have to see the silver lining and that's been like, I think it's made, a, made us appreciate it more, right? So when everything comes back, yeah, appreciate it more. So in the end, soccer community, basketball community, you know, whatever it is, like, it's just, it's just about people, man. And as long as like people just persevere, we'll be all right. But I think soccer community has done the most it can to be, to be resourceful. Yeah, I was thinking like, like now you said that like I'm a huge and was your fan. So I I just like imagine like that first game after everything is normal. That first game like Yankees It'd be crazy. Oh, yeah, you gonna you gonna go crazy. Like I hope it's soon, but I mean I don't think this year I, I doubt it. Um, supposedly I saw a news that the Miami Dolphins from the NFL is is providing 15k people for the stadium. So that's right. like that. But at the same time, I just feel like soccer is just like hard. Because we tried the bubble thing, and it was okay, you know. It was okay. But, like, basketball, like, for example, basketball just, like, the United States, basically. And now Europe is expanding stuff. But, like, soccer is, like, a whole worldwide stuff. And not a lot of people, yeah, I mean, like, look at what's, people know that. As we speak, we're watching international games all over. The South American World Cup qualifiers begin tonight, you know. And it's just, like, the game – in one way or another has continued to go on. But to your point, it's not as easy as the NBA going to one yeah. location. It's, it's so much more complex than that. But I believe that eventually we will get through this and crowds will come back. I think it's a little too soon for teams like the Miami Dolphins to bring fans. I, I, 
we still haven't got, I mean, you know, more than 210,000 people have died as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. This is no joke. We are by no means have beaten COVID-19. We have to be smart about it. And I, but I love football, soccer more than anybody in the world, right? But we have not beaten this, this uh, virus and we need to think of safety and health before anything else. Yeah. But I mean, the Super Cup, um, Bayern Munich, Sevilla, there was people and nothing bad happened, to be honest. So that's a good example of like the outcome. People have to be smart. Yeah. People have to be, I mean, I think there were worries and people did a lot of tracing. Nobody in the stadium could enter if they had a positive test, obviously. Yeah. Um, but the U.S. is nowhere near what Europe no. yeah. is. So, yeah. You know, you have to be careful about that. How, how about like Black Lives Matter and the social justice movement? How have you seen professional soccer players in, the, in your um, in social media play a big part what's happening yeah i mean absolutely i mean let's use mls as an example you know the black players coalition the black players for change mls group i interviewed them myself players like justin morrow earl edwards jr you know uh black players in mls because of what they saw during these this year they created a coalition and a group to not just like you know make statements and powerful messages which are important but they actually are now part of a movement that's trying to change how black players and black people are treated within inside mls right so i'm seeing black athletes i mean look at naomi osaka in the us open look at all these amazing individuals just not just saying things with their mouth and they're they're doing action they're creating action and that to me is very important. I think it's very important to see people kneeling and creating powerful statements, but what's really going to change is changing from the inside and seeing yeah. like what we can do there. And that's what organizations like Black Players for Change are doing. I really recommend everybody to check out their website and what they do on social media and everything else because you know it's, it's really quite amazing. Yeah, for sure. Um, I interviewed Sean Johnson, which is part of that as well. Absolutely. Like, well, way, Sean Johnson is a major part of this. Yeah, way, I mean, but way before, like, the bubble and what happened with George Floyd, but it was like, it was like, it's, he's the type of person who's not, like, afraid to do something, you know? Like, this, uh, you need, like, people like that because we've never seen actually people take action towards it, right? Um, just this year, to be honest. But, like, like years before, there was actually racial things happening. There was always protests, protests, but there was never like a big action that was, that's happening, you know? But like this year, I mean, now that we have videos, cameras, it's evidence. So I think that now we're actually having, we actually putting action. Like, I mean, you see LeBron James, the NBA even did something, even was about to cancel in the middle of the bubble. And, um, and the MLS doing as well. And then people even from a whole different continent, the Europe, are like helping us out, you know, and then also like trying to create their own like equality and unite it as a league. Which is Absolutely. Like Let me ask you a question. When, you know, you 17 years old, you know, do you feel you, your friends, are you inspired by that? Have you seen, have you seen yourself change because of everything that's going on? How do you feel about it? I mean, my, myself, um, myself, I mean, I feel inspired. I mean, like I'm, I uh, texted my coach and then I, I told them about it. And I was like, hey, I want to I wanna like give me the emails of every team we're facing each weekend. So, for example, today I had to send an email. But like, I want to like represent – because my like my teammates are like, at the end of the day, my brothers, right? And I'm not, and I'm not going to like let like one of my friends who, are, who is black like feel down. Like he feels down because the world is going against him. Like I don't want him to feel that, you know? So I made sure to talk to him. We're like, hey, do you mind if we do this and that and that? Do you mind like like talk to him like uh, as a real as a real brother, you know? Like I, I text him like, hey man, like I'm planning to text every coach from the league before the weekend we're gonna play to kneel and pay respects to those people who lost their life and also to pay respect to all those who are fighting for equality that we don't see. And then well, I talked to him. And that's and that's what's going on. Like. 
it started with the Jews. Like, we're going to be honest with each other. This is not going to change next year. It's not going to change. Like, if we start, because how my parents never taught me to hate somebody, you know? Like, this starts from this age, for this young, for our next generation, our kids, our grandsons, because feel like, we're like, wait, why do I have to hate somebody? You know? Well said, my friend. Well said. How has COVID-19 impacted your profession and your work as a journalist? I know I, I, I love ESPN, the journalism first take. I also see it um, CBS when the Champions League is on, way before pregame and postgames. I love the arguments and the debates, but the debates are something that's very special, is that in person is way better. How right. did that change you and your job? Yeah, well, it's changed a lot, Avi. I mean, you know, I'm talking to you now, like this is literally my studio now, right? My, my office at home. So every video, like you mentioned, when I'm on the Champions League show uh, or whenever I do any video hits uh, or the podcast that I'm going to be doing and stuff, like it's all from home. So, you know, uh, like you said, there's something different when you're physically in the same room as somebody else and then you can have a debate and a conversation. You but, feel the energy. But exactly, but you have to, and you have to understand that, like, like the, the reality is, like, most of the work that we do now is is remote, and you know, Zoom and other other uh, platforms have been able to help us with that. But it's not the same. But you know, we continue, we roll on. My wife is a public school second grade teacher, so you know, she has way bigger obstacles and bigger things. So sometimes we have to think. You know, we're very locked up from home when other people, essential workers, blessings. But, you know, one, like we said before, once we, once we overcome this, we will appreciate each other a little more, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Uh, I think teachers, like, a lot of people don't see that. Um, and myself, sometimes, some days, I don't see it as well. Talk about your wife. Uh, like, we don't see how, how much of an impact the teachers are doing, especially yeah. teachers that teach younger kids. Like, I remember, like, in the start, like, right now, it's very balanced because my, my little brother goes to school Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. But days, Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays. But back then, like, in March, April, like, my, my guy was only six, and he was going through the midlife crisis. <laughs> and, that, and, like, that's crazy. And then the, the teacher's trying to help him and stuff, but he can't do that when he's a baby, you know? It's, it's hard. It's hard times, but we just got to – we got to stick together and just keep rolling. The good times will come, I, I'm sure. Yeah. I, my mom always tells me that when the bad time comes, there's going to be a, something great happening. I'm saying that next year, there's going to be something that's happening next year that, whoa, it's going to, I'm calling it right now. Like, there's if something really happens, I want this script to be out there. Like, totally. hey, this guy hold it. Um, I have a good quote for you to remember, Ami. It's, 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 this is how it goes. Where there is light, must endure burning right before there's light you gotta have that burning of the fire so you gotta have the struggle before you can have the pleasure before we're gonna be all right yeah for sure um so in this time specifically specifically do you ever have a challenge balancing an objective as a journalist with also trying to make a positive difference to your audience sure i mean i think uh you know, the biggest challenges have always been to try, look, when you are in this uh, industry of media and journalism, the most important thing is trust. Yeah. Whoever you interview, whoever you talk to, they need to trust you. Anybody is going to just believe you or allow you to tell them your story, to tell them their story. You have to trust, they have, they have, you have to earn their trust. So, you know, I remember Copa America, not this Copa America. Uh, no, sorry, the World Cup. I went to Jackson Heights, right? Uh, a very big Latino community. And I wanted to go to different places and, for example, and, and go to a bakery that's Colombian and go to a bar that's Argentinian and go to a restaurant that's Peruvian. And because I'm Peruvian myself and South American, it becomes easier. They trust you because you're also Latino. But, you know, these are stories from people that, you know, are hardworking people who just want to, you know, work hard for their community. And you can't just go in there and be like, I want to do a story about you and stuff. Like yeah. you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be open and you gotta be 
trustworthy and you're going to make sure that they trust you. And that to me has always been the most important thing. You know, doing projects with South Bronx United. I remember doing projects. With, I couldn't just go in there and, and say, hey, I want to talk about your team and your players. Like, you got to allow yourself for them to know who you are. So that's the key thing. Trust is the most important thing. And that's always going to be a challenge because you can't just jump in there and say, I want to do a story about you. Yeah. No, you got to first learn from them, then you can say your story. Yeah, uh, so before I came in, I, I was very new, to be honest. Like, I never had experience about asking questions. I literally thought that it was more about, about like, <laughs> you write a question down and ask them. So, like, literally. Like, it's part of it. It yeah. is part of it. Yeah, but, but like, there's little like, things. There's little things that make it better. For example, um, if you see my first episode, it was just the questions. Then, then, I, then they told me, like, try to speak like, in between the question, like, how, like, try to like, make it as a conversation. And then I was thinking about it. It's better because, one, you have fun. And second of all, I have fun as well. So I don't have to be, look at it like, oh, my God, I got to do this interview with this guy. <laughs> I got to ask a question. Like, you're going to feel like you're at school. You know? Like, like I, I graduated, like, years ago, and now I have to ask a question for a kid. Like, that's annoying. And then and I used to think about it, like, at school, I like when teacher, like, asks me a question and keeps on going, like, but how about this and that and that, like, she talks to me instead of really, like, quizzing me, if that makes any sense. So, like, I think that every time somebody shows you could do that faster, because just, like, you could have a laugh, you could have, like, a, I don't know, like, a lot of emotions while you actually having the interview. Which is fine, man. It's fine. It's fine to do that. The key is trust, right? Like you said, make it a conversation. And it's not just about you ask a question and they answer, you ask a question and they answer. It's about building a relationship. Those are the best types of interviews when you allow yourself to just listen and make sure that they trust you. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so you talk about Sovereigns United and I, and I know you visited it. And you spoke with some of our student athletes like a few years ago. What yeah. do you think about those student athletes and SBU as well? I, SBU really inspires me. Uh, not just the organization and what uh, the guys behind the scenes do, but you guys, like the kids. I just, because it's not just about trying to be a good soccer player. It's about trying to be a good human being, a good student, a good person. And like, you know, I know the South Bronx pretty well. Um, I used to coach as well, not at SBU, but uh, in other places. Uh, and I, I do a lot to try and report and talk about the, the communities, not just in the South Bronx, but like in New York. And SBU to me exemplifies everything that's great about uh, the youth of not just the South Bronx or New York, but America. You know, and that's sometimes that we don't see enough, right? It's like this country is a melting pot of different nationalities and cultures. And like, I just feel like that's what SBU is all about. It's about not just being a good soccer player, but being a good human being and being a good student and trying to be, be the very best that you can be. And if I can tell those stories you know, to a bigger audience, then the better for it. And that's why I'm so, but I'm so, I'm just so inspired by the boys and the girls of SBU. Yeah, um, so one of the things that you said about like the multi point from other countries, that's like one of the main things why I love this view and I haven't left this view. Mm -hmm. Because when I said like earlier, like my, like my, my team is like my brothers, you know? And like, it's crazy because like I've learned so much from other countries. Like my, I have one of my teammates, he's, he's from Ghana. And I talked to him about it. He talked to me about how life is over there, and it's very, very cool. And you can see, like, you can even, they, like, usually uh, on warm-ups, like, we count in English. And the next warm-up, I mean, the next stretch, we count in French. And the next stretch, we count in Spanish. And that's, that's amazing, because, like, a lot of people start, like, going in, and then you start learning new things. And then um, it's, like, like you said, like, it's very, like, inspiring how you see like a lot of people like coming in together yeah and also like they don't they really don't want you to be a soccer player like you have to put the work in to be a soccer player that's for you to do but we want you to have a plan b to work hard on school 
and then they make sure that they do that and then they they really like I feel like they save a lot of people's from being a failure or being somebody they never wanted to be to someone who educating and having a great job in the future for their future families. So I think that's like one thing like I love about his view. And it just like it's very like I mean it's fine. I mean you see this like um Andrew gave me an opportunity to start this for the YouTube channel and then without him I wouldn't mean talking to you or talking to the doctor, Sean Johnson, Jimmy, like all of that, which is crazy. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. And listen, like, to your point, like, I wanted to be a soccer player when I was like 13, 14, right? Like, uh, you know, and but I found myself doing other things like learning the craft of the game, learning how to coach. Now I'm in the industry from a media perspective. There is never one path yeah. to success. There's a million paths. You just have to keep going and eventually it will take you to where you want to go. And what you're doing right now is amazing. I mean, think about all the people that you're interviewing. These are all your resumes, man. These are all just like all examples of the things that you can do. You're just becoming a better human being day by day. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. So you said in the beginning that you're going to start a podcast and which we will leave down below in the in the video we're going to leave the links but is there any other projects you want to do or you have coming up even yeah for sure i mean so the podcast is the first thing Kevo Lasso, and uh, you'll get the link and stuff so everybody i hope all your teammates all your brothers and sisters they sign up it's going to be awesome but other things that i'm doing i'll be uh, doing a few more interviews uh, with with different players. Uh, Serginho Des will be one of them later in the future. Um, obviously, we know how United States men's national team players are doing in Europe. Weston McKennie in Juventus, Pulisic in Chelsea. It's been crazy. It's been a crazy summer. So hopefully, we'll get some chats with some of those. And uh, yeah, you, the, the podcast will also be a video show. So we'll be interviewing a lot of players, managers, and coaches, and, and different people. So, But my aim is to really like, you know, talk to more people in the community like SBU and, and other soccer organizations that can be part of it. So I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, well, I'm excited for you and I wish you all the luck. And yeah, uh, I wish you all the luck, man. I wish you all the best. You're killing it. This show's amazing. <laughs>